I think my grandmother was an inspirational figure to me. She lived with us when I was a child and she really played a greater part in my upbringing than my mother because she was always there at the weekends when my parents weren't. She taught me to play cards, she taught me not to cheat at cards, she taught me how to cheat at cards, she took me to church. She was German and she'd come over from this country as a single mother fleeing, I think, from an abusive relationship with uh, her husband, my father's father. So she was the one who was really inspirational. And I think she instilled in me a need to learn and a need to be the best. So she made me the competitive person I am. I think my determination was really driven by being adopted because that always meant you had a will to succeed and a determination to do better than the next person. I mean, if you were an adopted child in the late 40s, it was because you came from a single parent family, an illegitimate child whose mother gave you away because you couldn't go on working. I don't know, I've never bothered to find out, but it was very important to me. I was good at English. I was good at Latin, so it seemed obvious that I should become a lawyer. And I was uh, faintly argumentative, I suppose, and difficult. So that seemed like the obvious choice. I chose company law and because I'd always enjoyed commercial law. I'd always enjoyed corporate law. I had a very um, good supervisor in company law who fixed me up to go to a very good company law set. And he got me my pupillage there. I had to pay 50 guineas for my six months pupillage. And um, I was foolish enough to go along for my pupillage interview wearing some very fashionable uh, high thigh length PVC white boots, which were very, very smart, but which my mother did not tell me were not appropriate. Anyway, um, I didn't think anything of it, and I got taken on as a, as a pupil, paid my money and turned up. Getting a tenancy was the real problem, and it took me uh, three years and four pupillages to get a tenancy, and uh, there was a horrific story in one set of chambers where I had a wonderful mini practice as a squatter, as we were called, people who hung on in there once our pupillages had formally come to an end. And I was going out all over the country. And when I asked my pupil master, why wasn't I being kept on? Uh, he said, well, we don't take women in these chambers. So I said, why not? I've earned X or whatever it was during my last six months. Uh, why wouldn't you want to take me on? Oh, well, he said, the wives of members of chambers wouldn't like it. So I said, why not? Well, in case uh, their husbands make passes at you or you seduce their husbands. Well, as I'd been absolutely meticulous about not succumbing to any advance made by them and, and you know that's what they did I thought that was rather unfair and I said so anyway it was the best bit of luck for me because instead of doing matrimonial work I ended up back in the Chancery Division I took silk in 1989 it was the first time I'd applied I was 39 I didn't particularly want to apply Apply. I was doing the Guinness case at the time and by this time I'd had two children and they seemed to be doing perfectly well and it was a dream it was th the best thing I'd ever done and I really enjoyed the responsibility of being in the front row and the first really good case I got 
was being flown out on Concord to Bermuda to do what was billed as a seven-day uh, case, seven-day case to uh, take over from another QC who was flying on to Hong Kong, a much more uh, experienced one. Well, the seven days um, proved a myth. We were there throughout July, throughout August, and throughout September, and my children came out for a week's holiday. And that was all quite emotional, because when I sent them back, they were going to boarding school for the first time. And so I cried my eyes out at the airport when their little brown faces waved goodbye. But they simply, they didn't care. They simply said, don't be weird, Mummy. We've had a lovely 10 days in Bermuda. Uh, see, see you at Christmas. And I don't think they minded much. I don't think I've ever managed to get my work-life balance right. I think that you have to be clear in your own mind whether the bar comes first or whether your children come first. I don't think in a demanding profession like being a QC, you can say, well, I'm always going to put my children first. Obviously, if they're ill, that's something else. But the amount of uh, rugger matches and school plays I missed because of my work was legion. And, but that's just one of the prices you pay, and I don't think my children suffered any more. But I think women do have to be prepared to delegate childcare because, and they have to be prepared to spend money on childcare. And um, a lot of my overdraft racked up because of the need to do that. I didn't particularly want to become a judge from the off. As I went into silk and did more and more high profile work, I decided that I did want to become a judge because the satisfaction of actually deciding something rather than being paid through the nose to put forward somebody else's argument or somebody else's case. Uh, that was not as exciting as actually deciding the thing oneself. So I spoke to my accountant and my ex-husband, my then husband, and they were very against it because the drop in income was huge and we still had very large liabilities. So the first time I was asked to go on the Chancery bench, I said no. But um, by the time it came to the third time when I was asked not to go to the Chancery Division, but to the Commercial Court, I thought, uh, yes, the time has come in my life when I can put something back into the system. There just isn't an issue, certainly in commercial work, which I do, about employing a woman as a barrister or as a solicitor. And that is what has changed in my lifetime. I don't think I and my colleagues who've done commercial work have been any sort of pioneers or pilgrims or anything of that sort. I think, I think it's just evolved with the woman's movement. Certainly in the judicial profession, there is no discrimination against women. That, well, that's my view from my perspective. I don't really believe in glass ceilings. I've never felt any hostility in my preferment or lack of preferment because I was a woman. I, okay, I was the first uh, woman judge to be appointed to the commercial court, and I was therefore the first woman judge who was head of the commercial court. I think there may be, perhaps, or there might have been then, an idea that women were family lawyers or criminal lawyers, but couldn't be trusted with the tough commercial stuff. So I was very pleased, if I was breaking a glass ceiling, to demonstrate, as indeed is the case, that there are loads of commercial solicitors um, throughout the city of London and solicitors and barristers 
and we can do the job just as well, if not better, than the men. I mean, it's, it just depends on you.